And now, I am delighted to introduce the moderator of our final panel, Gary Nell, the president and CEO of Sesame Workshops. Mr. Nell leads the nonprofit educational organization and has been instrumental in focusing Sesame, Sesame Street's global mission, uh, including groundbreaking co-productions in South Africa, India, Northern Ireland, and Egypt. He also uh, helped found PBS Kids Sprout, a 24-hour domestic cable channel in the U.S. Mr. Nell. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you so much um, to the USIP and ITBS for bringing us all together today. It's been an incredible morning, and this is a tough act to follow, uh, but usually start with the young kids and work up to grown-ups, and we got it flipped around today, so we're going to have to, like, turn the turn the dial back. You know, I've been spending a lot of, a lot of time in Northern Ireland, and... and um, the God's honest truth is I now have Jerry Adams from Sinn Féin wearing a Cookie Monster watch. So I feel like I should quit now while I'm ahead. Um, we, we toured a integrated school. There aren't too many there. And, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of immigrants in, uh, in Northern Ireland now, along with the rest of the U.K. And a little girl came into the class. Who, a new kid joined this classroom of four-year-olds and... And uh, another little girl ran up to her, very excited, and said, oh, welcome. What's your name? She says, Mona. She goes, well, well what are you? And Mona says, I'm Muslim. And uh, the little girl looks at her very oddly and says, were you a Catholic Muslim or a Protestant Muslim? <laughs> and the reason why I tell this story is because that's what we're dealing with uh, around Sesame Street. And those of us in early childhood, you know, as the tape said, uh, that film clip that children are not born to hate. This is a learned capacity. And uh, we know now from research at Queen's University in Belfast and, and others that children as young as three years of age are showing these kinds of discriminatory attitudes towards other races and ethnicities, religions, etc. And, um, and this only gets exa exacerbated, I think, by the media environment that they are growing into. The other just opener that I will tell you as a story is about my grandmother who, um, who grew up talking about the refrigerator as this amazing thing, the ice box, right? Amazing. And I never t thought about the refrigerator. It was an appliance. And when we think about our Blackberries and iPods and iPads and, and PS2s and you know, and everything else that De Nintendo DS is, we think of these things as these incredible things that, oh, my God, look what this does and that does. Well, our kids do not look at these things that way. They are appliances. They will never know the world before the Internet, never know the world before cell phones, never know the world for high-speed Internet in many countries, mobile phones, uh, Nintendo DS's, iPods, and iPads. It's very hard for those of us as adults to get inside that head and begin to think about building a world uh, for children um, and trying to hand down the lessons that we want to teach them, but in a different way in which children are learning now. This is why Sesame Street is actually, um, this afternoon, applying to the U.S. Department of Education to launch a, in four cities in America an actual intervention in pre-K programs using digital assets of 40 years of Sesame Street, teaching cognitive basics, health outcomes, and social and emotional learning. This is how kids are learning. Let's use those assets to get children, some 50% of whom are failing in our public schools in America, let's figure out a way to use these assets. We've now grown to 140 countries around the world. We just celebrated our 40th birthday. And in at least uh, 30 of those, we have indigenous co-productions, as you saw. So we're working in places like South Africa with an HIV-positive Muppet named Kami, who can teach children there, some one in nine who are infected, that you can be friends with someone and play with them and not necessarily get sick, to deal with symptoms to try to destigmatize de those children so that you open up a dialogue around HIV and AIDS to finally get South Africa's head around tackling that crippling disease. And now, thanks to USAID, we're going to take that into six other 
sub-Saharan African country shortly with CAMI at, at the same time, or in Egypt with girls' education, where 60% of the female population is illiterate. We have little Hoha, who is a young girl Muppet who wants to become a lawyer or a doctor or work for Search for Common Ground or something, but she's got a great uh, path towards success, which we want to give to young girls in Egypt. And working in social and emotional learning like Northern Ireland or Israelis and Palestinians or in Kosovo, these are tough places. And as John said in his video, we're not naive about this, but we do believe that by showing a picture of the other, you can uh, present something in the privacy of one's own living room that you may not be able to talk about out in the cafe. And we think that, um, that by showing the other and realizing the similarities to me as a Catholic versus the Protestant kid down the street or a Serb and an Albanian, it's much harder to hate someone when you know someone on the other side. So that's really the premise of what Sesame Street is trying to do. The enormous youth bulge that exists in the world. We heard this morning about all of the technologies that are changing the world every week. I mean, it's hard to believe that it was 15 years ago, we really did not have the web in, its, in any kind of a high-speed capacity in this country, in Europe, and other developed countries. You remember dial-up web where you'd get busy signals all the time? It wasn't until we really had this 24-7 web capacity that, we, that things like Facebook, things like Twitter, things like YouTube could actually take off. They would not exist in a dial-up world. And the rest of the world is, of course, catching up with those, mostly through mobile phone technologies, some 5 billion mobile phones now in the world. So sub-Saharan African countries, South Asia, uh, many parts of the world, Latin America, that were living in poverty, you saw those explosive numbers of growth in mobile devices. These are teaching tools for the 21st century. Those of us in the education business need to be focused on those tools as the next generation of teachers in the world, which is where Sesame Street started 40 years ago and now where we will work in this century and we will work with colleagues like you all to try to build, build a better world by using these technologies, which is why we're here. We have a, an amazing panel of people uh, this afternoon who I'm so privileged to have on stage with me, Jared Cohen, who is who is on the Secretary of State's Policy Planning Staff, a good friend. He has been chair of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff Working Group on 21st Century Statecraft. Jared has applied new te techniques and technologies in developing a new youth-focused vision for a public diplomacy that effectively counters extremism among youth and promotes peace building. Jared is perhaps best known for his work using U.S.-based social media companies to advance U.S. interests internationally, having taken a delegation of leading executives from new media outlets to Baghdad recently. I think you're probably personally responsible for getting Eric Schmidt over there to digitize the entire uh, Iraqi State Museum recently, requesting Twitter in June 2009 to stay online during the Iranian election protests, to enable activists to continue using it. He's also the author of Children of Jihad. I'd like to welcome to the stage Jared Cohen first. <laughs> Shamil Idris is the chief executive officer of Solia and oversaw its recent merger with the United Nations Alliance of Civilians Initiative. Solia uses new media technology to facilitate dialogue between students from diverse backgrounds across the globe. At a time when media plays an increasingly powerful role in shaping people's viewpoints on political issues, Solia provides students in North Africa, the Middle East, and the United States with the opportunity, skills, and tools to shape and articulate their own viewpoints on some of the most pressing global issues facing this generation. He was also the Chief Operating Officer of Search for Common Ground, the International Conflict Resolution Organization, where he also managed their office in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Please welcome Shamil Idris. <laughs> 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 
Barubu Gekunda is uh, creating the partnership between media focus on Africa and search for common ground. Barubu mastered the masterminded the creation of that wildly successful uh, program on the Kenyan sports team called the Team. It, Kenya is split by ethnic violence. We all read about or experienced following the 2007 election. Barubu used the storylines afforded by the struggles of small-time soccer to demonstrate effective techniques for responding to conflict nonviolently. With high production values and focusing on the national pastime of football, someday the U.S. will also join in that, <laughs> God willing. Uh, the team provided a means to reach out to the young men that dispensed much of the violence. Please welcome Barubu Gakunda. David Kleeman is the president of the American Center for Children and Media. He is a leading light in the U.S. media industry's development of a media environment supportive of children's needs. And in an executive roundtable of TV and digital industry leaders, the center that David founded and organized promotes the exchange among industry partners of the ideas, expertise, and best practices necessary to deliver high-quality entertaining and informational media content to children. He's been a consultant to Pre Jeunesse, to the Global Summit on World's Children. This is someone who's really dedicated his career to helping children through media. Please welcome to the stage David Kleeman. <laughs> and finally, Sandra Buffington, uh, who is a leading practitioner of social marketing and communications that foster social change on a global scale, responsible to, during her tenure at USAID, uh, for an international communications portfolio that exceeded $100 million in budget, which I'm sure you have now as well, uh, and that targeted global health and reproductive rights. Sandra now directs the Hollywood Health and Society programs at USC's Annenberg School for Communications, a partnership to provide the entertainment industry professionals with accurate, timely, and credible information for storylines, including public health issues. Please welcome Sandra to the stage. So um, to get it started, panel, um, we, uh, we've heard a lot this morning about uh, the revolution around change media. Um, and I'd, I'd like to maybe go down the line here, maybe starting on the far side, Jared, with um, how, how has social media, how has the web uh, and so-called new media, uh, do you view it as an opportunity for change? Uh, or a threat uh, to civilization? Big question. And, and, and a fair question for, for somebody on the policy side. Um, you know, one of the things that's important to note is as we look at the new virtual commons and how to actually think about it as it pertains to support for civil society or support for democracy, uh, technology doesn't sort of change things. Technology doesn't in and of itself do anything. It's just a tool that can be utilized for good or for bad. People are still the primary agents of change. So the question is, when you throw technology into the mix, how does that empower different subsets of society? How does that transform dynamics? And that, to me, is the really interesting question. Um, and the debate that we have in government is exactly as Gary mentioned, which is you put this technology out there, can't bad people use it for hostile purposes, but also we see it being utilized by a large number of people uh, for civic empowerment as well as a variety of other things. I want to actually answer this question just by uh, beginning with a, a very quick story from when I was living in Iran in 2004 and 2005 before I was in government because it really shaped a lot of how I think about this, which is I was in a, uh, a marketplace in the southern Iranian city of Shiraz, and I saw a lot of young people perched against uh, the walls of a busy intersection of about six different alleyways, and they were all fiddling around on their cell phones, and I asked them, what are you doing? And they said, I'm using Bluetooth. And I had always thought of Bluetooth as that kind of creepy device where you walk around talking to yourself with the earpiece. And I had never realized that it allows you to call and text complete strangers as long as they're within 200 yards of you. Um, and so I asked them, what are you doing? And some of them were organizing, you know, underground book clubs. Some of them were, uh, you know, organizing for political purposes. One of them re was recruiting a new basis for his band. I think a couple of them were picking up girls. I mean, they were doing sort of a variety of things. And I asked them, I said, aren't you worried that you're going to get caught doing this. You're all out here in the open, you know, organizing to do things that you're not supposed to do. And they looked at me and they said, nobody over 30 knows what Bluetooth is. 
Now, that's very interesting because it sums up a generation gap in a country of 70 million people where 67 percent is under the age of 30. But there's two important things that I took away from this. You know, most of what they told me they were doing was, you know, very frivolous. And you're wondering, you know, so kids are organizing to have a good time at night. Why is that relevant to anything? Well, the same young people that were using Bluetooth to organize to do fun things that they weren't supposed to do were learning how to organize to uh, uh, come together uh, behind uh, uh, the grip of, of, of the police state, and they used those same tactics to organize politically in June of 2009. But the more interesting thing, which is relevant to the question that Gary asked, is when I went back to the U.S. and started talking to companies like IBM and others that have actually been at the forefront of Bluetooth technology and told them these stories, they didn't realize that Bluetooth could be utilized for this. And so it summed up a very, it summed up a very important innovation gap that also exists, which is, you know, None of us in this room, no matter or in Silicon Valley, regardless of how smart an engineer somebody is, can possibly imagine how the tools that they innovate for profit or for mission or for anything else will be innovatively used when you throw it in an environment where people rely on those tools as a way to connect to civil liberties uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and it's just something that you can't possibly imagine until you need it. I mean, I doubt you know, more than a handful of people here have ever read the instructions manual to their cell phones. And to be honest, why would you? You live in societies that are free and open where you have your civil liberties, whereas if you're in a place like Iran or a place, you know, someplace uh, where there's censorship or, or restrictions, if you don't read the instructions manual five times over and figure out how to use every element of this technology, then you know, you're losing out on an opportunity. So why does that matter, right? So you're empowering citizens. Now, they could be empowered for good or for bad. Um, you know, the debate that we have in, in, in government is, you know, how much do we embrace this new phenomenon given the risks? And, you know, I'll just – there's a lot more that I can say about this, but I just want to sort of give you a sense of how we frame the debate, um, which is – it's inevitable. I'm not a tech utopian by any stretch of the imagination, but I am a techno-pragmatist in the sense that whether we like it or not, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, you name it, they're putting it out on the public domain. And as a policy person, we have two choices, fear that we can't control it and don't try to influence it and just give more space for hostile actors to use it for nefarious purposes, or recognize that the 21st century is a terrible time to be a control freak, and there's, you may as well try to influence it um, if you can't control it, and the time to influence it would be before you know, cell phone penetration is 100% or internet penetration is 100%. So you can do things like what Gary's talking about of bringing access under the auspices of education and cross-cultural programs and so forth. It's a lot more that I, I, I can say, but I assume we'll, we'll get to it later. Um, tough act to follow, but it's, it's uh, I think really fundamentally, I, I would agree with one of the primary things Jared's point was it really was, which is that I think that new media technology, social media, all this, it's no more, sort of, I think it's value agnostic. I mean, it's no more morally good or bad than the invention of the telephone and can be used, you know, uh, for good or bad purposes. I think there are two things that it enables, uh, and I think there's also be, there's also, you know, some of us get seduced by new media a little bit and need to be more realistic about what it provides and what it really doesn't provide. So on the hand of what it provides, a lot of people have talked today about the importance of narrative and the importance of giving voice to a diversity of narratives and that exposure of oneself to those diversity of narratives really helps you live in a more pluralistic, interdependent society and world. And whether we like being in that world or not because it's a scary place to be, it's the reality of what we're in. And so clearly new media technologies and social media technologies allow you to link up to and be exposed to narratives and perspectives that you used to only be able to get through books or if you had the money to travel. And so that's, uh, that's an enabling thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen because a cool platform is put up. The second thing that you know, I think it allows is it's, it's really allowed for this shift from, from content to conversation, which is so much of the media industry is now struggling with or embracing, but no matter, how, no matter what, is, 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 is moving towards. And the kind of media that was simply getting your message out, a one-to-many approach to media, obviously is shifting increasingly to a many-to-many -many interactive form of communication and conversation. Um, whether that's going to be a constructive kind of engagement or not, again, uh, new media tools don't make that constructive. They simply enable it to happen. I can pick up the telephone and yell racial epithets or somebody at somebody, or I can pick up the telephone and try and have a constructive conversation with them. Uh, what we deal with at Solio a lot is how to marry the latest in these new media technologies that are enabling this exposure to diverse narratives and this shift to conversation, not simply one-way messaging, um, with tried and true practices and processes for cross-cultural engagement and conflict resolution. And how to marry the process with the scalability of the technology is not something that I have seen done extraordinarily well. It's still in very much the experimental phases, and I think it's really critically important. So for me, 
Um, Jared talks about getting in before cell phone penetration has, has reached, you know, 100%, whatever it is. For us, the approach is very much how do we pilot and then enable young adults who are using this technology much more so than, than I am or, other, or particularly people over the age of 35 are, um, to be the leaders in using the technology, you know, for those, for those ends. Uh, and, you know, I think for Americans here, um, this – uh, I don't know how many people saw Michael Moore's Bowling for Columbine, but you know, probably to me, one of the most profound things in that whole film was uttered by Marilyn Manson, the heavy metal rocker with the makeup and the G-string and all that, when he was asked, you know, the kids who shot up the school in Columbine were fans of your music. You got criticized a lot for it. If you could talk to them, you know, right before the morning of that attack, what would you say to them? And Manson immediately shot back, I wouldn't say anything. I'd listen to them. That's not what, it, that's what nobody did. And one of the things that we found in our work in predominantly Muslim societies, Western Europe and the U.S., is the opportunity to be heard, not just your personal narrative, but particularly if you're in societies where you feel like your society's narrative is either not being heard or is being distorted purposefully or distorted out of ignorance, but nevertheless distorted to the outside world. Simply the feeling of being heard out is extraordinarily effective and a productive way of opening someone's engagement with the rest of the world. And we supported some research at the Sachs Neuroscience Lab at MIT, which you can find on our website, which I encourage you all to go to, not just because it draws traffic to us, but it's great to have neuroscientists at MIT telling you, yes, interaction around media is really what opens up people's mind, not simply broadcasting media to them, but the interaction that it enables. And the experience of being heard, particularly from societies where they feel oppressed or marginalized, has an incredibly ameliorative effect on their sense of alienation um, and frankly, the proclivity towards violence. Well, I think, <clears throat> for me, obviously, coming from a background where there isn't too much penetration um, of telecommunications and that sort of, uh, the sort of communication, I suppose, that we're talking about here, um, new media presents opportunities, um, opportunities um, to, to reach out to a lot more people. I mean, you're talking about where, where we don't have, um, you know, so many fixed lines, um, mobile phones obviously have got a lot more. There are a lot more people who've got mobile phones. Therefore, they know there is an opportunity there. But I think the point to be made is that it's about relevance. People would make use of what that which they consider to be a lot closer to them, um, and that which can resonate more with uh, what it is that they believe in, what it is that they stand for, and that sort of thing. And in instances where people think they would like to be able to know where the next um, watering point for their animals will be then they want to be able to find, to use a gadget that is closest to them. And if the mobile phone is that gadget, then, so, then that's, what they will, that's what they will use. I think it's about, um, the, you know, it's about the possibilities, possibilities of the new media that's present. Great. David? I'm going to, as, as others have before me, take a little bit of issue with the, the framing of the question, with the dichotomy of it. I, I was watching uh, Chris Matthews the other day, and he was talking about over the past weekend, President Obama, in giving a graduation speech, talked about iPads, iPads, Xboxes, and such as being distractions. Now, at the risk of criticizing our president, he, he did follow that by saying, I don't know how to use any of them. And it seems to me if you say, I don't know how to use any of them, it makes it less effective when you're critiquing their use. Um, we heard this morning about some of the, the research from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And here, I think the research is brilliant. I think the framing of it that's been used is where the flaw lies, because we keep talking about the amount of con media consumption that young people are engaging in. The fact is, much less than, we, than you might think of what they're doing is purely consumption. There's a lot of creation, communication. And I think what, what this is changing is the context in which young people are growing up. When I, was, when I was young, my circle of friends, my circle of connections was limited to those I could reach physically. At first, it was the kids right next door as I was very young. As I grew older, it was the kids down the block, across the street, as I was given a little more freedom to roam. Today, it may be the case that a manga fan who lives near me in Chicago is friends with another manga fan, is closer friends with another manga fan in Tokyo than with the kid next door in Chicago who plays the violin. But the kid in, in Chicago who plays the violin may be playing duets online with someone who lives in Amsterdam or, or uh, Tel Aviv or you know, anywhere around the world. Kids are much better able to find colleagues and, and friends based on their interests and their, um, and their abilities and, uh, and their skills than they are necessarily on just who's, who's nearby. And they're doing amazing things with it. Now, you know, I, I 
there, there are some ways that it can be misused. There's the danger that people will only relate to people who are very much like them and will not get out and see that, that broad perspective. I'm encouraged by some research that uh, your colleague, now Gary Patty Miller, did when she was at Children Now that found that most American children say that one of their best friends is of a different race, religion, some you know, a substantially different background of some sort. But I, I have to share with you the most wonderful example of, of people, of young people coming together through digital media to create uh, peacemaking that I, that I found while I was looking toward this panel. And that's the Harry Potter Alliance. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a group of young people who are fans of the Harry Potter books who have formed essentially an, a, a virtual NGO. They're based all around the world, and they've divided. When you join, you register for one of the houses, and they have competitions among the houses to do good. So they just raised 40,000 books for a literacy organization. And their, their essential practices, their, their underpinning has to do with equality um, across race, sexual preference, gender, with uh, solving some of the big problems of the world by applying their, their overall expertise to it. I think what we adults um, need to bring to this, I mean, they're doing a lot of this for themselves. When I first got started in this business, and it reveals a little about how old I am, Space bridges were the big thing. Satellite space bridges, allowing young children in America to talk to children in Russia, to talk to children in China. And what we forgot was content. They'd open up the satellite and you'd see the kids sort of looking at each other. <laughs> we can provide that structure that, allow, that gives them a starting point, the, you know, the grain of sand that you need to grow the pearl, so that they can use the technologies they're used to and we can give them the starting point for conversation. Well, I'd like to reframe the question, too. Um, we work primarily with Hollywood, with entertainment programming. Uh, we work with script writers and producers to get accurate social messages into TV storylines. So you may not have noticed that when you're watching Grey's Anatomy or Law & Order SVU or 90210 or Lincoln Heights that you're actually learning as you go because these are messages that are not preachy. They're an integral part of compelling narratives. Um, and we use a transmedia approach. So it's not either or. And I'm, I'm going to um, segue into, there, there was a conference started at MIT called Beyond Broadcast. I don't know if anybody here attended. And for the first two years, it was just the new media community. And after a while, they approached me on the third year, and they said, you know, we realize something's missing. We went to our presenters and asked them, if you could have your new media strategy or, or approach featured on primetime television, would you care? And they all said, of course, that would be the best thing we could have. And so they realized that we're really talking about an integration of what's considered old and new media. So, for example, we uh, consulted on a storyline on 90210, you know, program for teenagers on bipolar disorder. It was a six-week story arc. We had our psychiatrist consulting, uh, working with the writers and producers. Um, once the storyline was accurate and was on air, uh, we did a PSA uh, using the lead actor, referring viewers to a website. And a lot of kids went to this website. We saw it, we tracked the traffic to these websites. Huge spikes. Once they got there, they could subscribe in dis discussion threads. There they could generate their own content. They were telling their own stories around bipolar disorder. Um, this went to viral media. Perez Hilton, the you know, celebrity blogger, picked it up. He posted the same web link on his site, and one of his bloggers said, hey, hey, Perez, you were watching 90210 last night. So I don't see this as easy, either or. The package is very powerful. Um, when we talk about transmedia, we define it as um, – the use by, on the part of the viewer of multiple platforms to piece together health or social messaging. They can't get the entire story from one site. They have to go across all of these platforms. Great. Um, David, I'm still, I have Vladimir Posner stuck in my brain now. You're going to, you know, about the space bridge. <laughs> How many people remember Vladimir Posner? Okay. A um, few hands went up. <laughs> I have a, some specific questions. Um, Jared, um, the State Department, you obviously sit in a very um, 
powerful position in terms of uh, defining a message that the United States wants to uh, give out to the world. And I'm, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, not just uh, the technology piece and the savvy nature of the receiver and the person who is, um, who, who is interacting with you, but how does the State Department go about determining the message in this complex environment? Well, I mean, I think it, it is important to broaden it beyond just the, the message, and it's hard to talk about the message without talking about the tools th themselves. So you know, when we talk about, you know, we call them connection technologies because what we're talking about is cell phones and Internet and cell, phone, uh, cell phones that, that are 3G capable. They connect individuals to information, i.e. new media, to each other and entities, i.e. social media, and then a whole new universe of activity that we're coming to grips with, which is actual resources, be they financial, as is the case with mobile banking, be they health, as is the case with telemedicine, be, is, be they justice, as is the case with telejustice, or distance learning, as is the case with, with education. And so we're looking at the whole universe of it. And in some cases, you know, the message is less important than who the messenger is or what the tool of dissemination is. You can come up with the greatest message in the entire world with, you know, all the right stakeholders involved, but if you want to reach young people and you're not using you know, the right technologies, you may not even get it there, and you've then wasted, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Um, but in terms of, 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 you know, how we actually look at this larger universe, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we often see made is for people to assume that the digital space is something separate from the traditional realms that we already execute our policy in. And so we look for different sorts of solutions. So take civil society. The way that we've thought about civil society traditionally is NGOs with offices, with hired staff that apply for grants and give them out to local organizations, individuals, or entities. Uh, what we've seen over the last several years, whether it was the anti-FARC protests in Colombia, whether it was the social upheaval in Iran, the Twitter revolution in Moldova, there's so many different examples of this, is that you know a new generation of activists that are sort of your unlikely or your non-traditional leader are taking the traditional advocacy that we've seen for decades beyond the traditional realms and into cyberspace. And so when Secretary Clinton decided to give her big internet freedom speech in, uh, on January 21st in the museum, um, part of her rationale for giving this is if a whole new generation of leaders are advocating in an expanded civil society from what we've traditionally looked at, then the policies that have governed how we engage, empower, support them in the traditional realm should also guide how we support, engage, and empower them in uh, these new realms. Um, and so part of the logic behind her internet freedom speech was, you know, looking at this universe of stakeholders that are advocating for human rights, democracy, whatever it might be, on the blogs, on the social networks, on their cell phones, and looking at how we treat them as we would treat ordinary elements of civil society. So, you know, the point that I often make is, you know, take a blogger. People don't get arrested for blogging, they get arrested for dissent, right? You know, the blog is just what their office looks like. You know, people don't get arrested for using social networks, they get arrested because of the things that they do on social networks. And the larger way that we're thinking about this is civil society, it's now, it now is expanded and includes those that have URLs and offices instead of websites, those that have followers and members instead of paid staff, and those that use open source platforms instead of you know, applying for grants or having robust budgets. So what that means from a policy standpoint is it completely changes the nature of who we engage. It completely the, changes the nature and the definitions of how we support. Um, it also completely changes the nature of what stakeholders we bring into the mix. Part of the reason that I routinely bring executives from Silicon Valley to places like Iraq and Mexico and Russia and a variety of other places is because we, the U.S. government, we know the stakeholders and have relationships with the stakeholders who understand the local context. But to me, statecraft is just a fancy way of troubleshooting the world's challenges. And if you're troubleshooting anything, you want to connect the experts on the most innovative tools with the experts that understand the local context. So our, you know, our policy is such that we play facilitator. Sometimes the State Department is most effective acting as a convener, a connector, and a conceptual partner where we bring together experts who understand 21st century tools with experts that you know, understand the local context and issue in country A, B, C, D, or all of them, and facilitate a conversation that wouldn't otherwise take place. Um, and that, to me, is sort of the essence of what we call 21st century statecraft. You know, we by no means have it all figured out by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, we sort of broken down this culture of risk aversion, and we're willing to, to try new things and bring in new stakeholders, whether th people think it makes sense intuitively or not. <clears throat> it's really interesting. I, I 
think a lot about this issue like with Harry Potter and Avatar and the fact that these have such massive uh, mass appeal uh, all around the world and I remember being in Cambodia once and every and the streets were cleared in Phnom Penh at nine o'clock at night because MacGyver was coming on television um, and there is something about Hollywood there's something about US uh, uh, entertainment that has a universal appeal somehow. Um, when we used to export Duke Ellington to Kabul to give a concert in the football stadium there, um, uh, I'd love to hear the panel a little bit talk about what Jared just mentioned. Is, is, is there a big role in public diplomacy for technologists in this country to transfer some of their know-how to, uh, to developing generators of uh, of use in these different countries in social and new media? Yes, there is. <laughs> um, what's really important is that we move away from a campaign model to a sustained and systematic form of outreach to the creative community. And we need to do that in the major media markets that serve developing countries as well as in the U.S. And we're doing this now in Hollywood. Um, we don't do campaigns. When you do a campaign, you pay for it. You're either producing or co-producing. You have control of the product. You have control of the end product. You may not have control of the outcome, but you know what your end product will look like. Um, that's very costly. When you're producing, you're paying. In Hollywood, we don't pay for anything. We're simply a resource to the creative community. So we, first of all, have to learn what their needs are. What they will tell us, the writers will say, we have a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West. They say, my job is to tell a compelling story. And we say, okay, we'll help you make your stories more compelling by making them more realistic. And we will provide you a free resource of expor experts on any health topic you need. Now, we could extend this to conflict transformation. It could be climate change and the environment. It could be finance and economic development. We can... We can pair up experts, any kind of expert, with the writers. The key is that we're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We help them meet their deadlines. We give them story ideas, not storylines. They're the master storytellers, and this is really important. Every single issue group in the world wants to get their issue portrayed in Hollywood. So don't pitch your storyline. What we do is present case studies, real stories of real people. This gives them ideas. They spin them. And going to the power of narrative, this was mentioned on the panel, um, we know that there is a measurement which is called um, a measurement of transportation, the degree to which the viewer is engrossed or transported by a storyline. There are huge knowledge gains, attitude shifts, and behavior changes when a viewer has been transported into a storyline, which means they forget where they are, they lose track of time. They come to see these characters as beloved friends or family. This is much more powerful than preaching at people or telling them what the story is. It, it allows them to become fully immersed and to discover the message themselves. I'll stop there. Sure, maybe I'm, I'm just being obstinate today, but I, I again want to turn the question around. That I, I think we're talking about it as though it's a one-way flow. Uh, from the U.S. out to the rest of the world. I think one of the biggest gaps that we have is we don't bring enough from the rest of the world back to the U.S. I served as chair of the advisory board for the International Children's TV Festival. So I have a chance to see programming from around the world. And there are some amazing models that for low-cost production, high-quality production, that allow cultures to exchange with each other, not by taking all the culture out of programs, but by, by sharing work done, exclu done within a particular country. The exchange model where <coughs> excuse me, each country produces one program and shares the rights with all the others that participate so that you get not only low-cost programming, but you get examples of how media would be produced from 10 or 15 different countries. I think there are some encouraging signs here in the U.S. that we are starting to look beyond our own borders for children's content in particular that exposes young people to, to other cultures. The new president of the Disney Channel comes from Latin America. She's from their Brazilian office, so she's going to be looking worldwide. Nickelodeon is starting to bring programs from its global uh, channels back to the U.S. now. 
Um, we have here in the audience today MHZ Networks that is bringing programming from around the world and putting it out on digital channels and has launched a children's service now. So I think let's, let's look at this as a, not a one-way arrow either way, but as a, a circle. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about policy, especially in the American policy. But I just I know about one thing that um, you know there is need for engagement. There's need for engagement between people and among people. Um, in the 2008, the period, well, we call it the darkest period in our country, 2007 elections. Then we got we descended into a period when we we hacked one another, and people used mobile phones to create uh, fear among one another. You know messages started circulating to the effect that uh, the army was uh, getting out on the streets to, to spread terror. Um, messages were, were, were sent, out, sent around saying stuff like, you know, the police commissioner has resigned. And a lot of the information that was coming across was not necessarily the truth, but it was used to cause whatever, uh, whatever you know, to spread whatever fear people wanted to spread and that sort of thing. I think um, if only the technology, if only um, the, the possible you know, media was used to harness the good um, and to communicate and to you know, put across facts you know, from away from uh, people's perceptions, I think there would have been a, there would have been a major difference uh, at that time. Would it have um, helped if, say, the Americans um, had a policy towards uh, uh, encouraging the use of new media differently? Perhaps it would have. Indeed, the Americans did come across very strongly at the time when, um, we, you know, when we were uh, at, that, at that moment. Um, it did, they did not specifically target the use of media at that time, um, but indeed there were other areas that they did look at. Um, but I, I dare say that you know they, there is a need, I think, for uh, engagement on what is it that, how is it that we can allow people to communicate between themselves, because ultimately it's about that which the people think works for them. If the people don't take ownership for it, it doesn't matter what the Americans think. If the if Kenyans don't think it works for them, I mean, the Americans can shout all they want, or indeed anybody else for that matter. One of the things that we struggle with all the time is the, wor the word clutter, and we just view, there have been other, <coughs> I think, synonyms used to that, used for that today. Um, the world is just filled with too much on the hard drive, and it's very hard in this media environment. I'd love to hear from the panel uh, prognosis uh, on television um, and feature films in terms of hitting mass audiences. Um, is this a technology that will be with us for a long time in this long-form storytelling, hitting mass audiences? Or are we, are, are we going to see really that business model disappear and be divided up into a million little pieces? Well, television is definitely here to stay. Now, the nature of programming is changing, for sure. Um, yeah, Hollywood is probably one of the most powerful form of storytelling in the world, and that is not going away. And now, of course, it's less expensive to do reality programming, and we see a huge increase in unscripted programming. But I, I want to tie this to the changing nature of programming in general. There used to be a very clear line between children's programming and adult programming. There were certain hours that we saw children's shows. Now, maybe this was talked about earlier today. I actually am sorry I wasn't here. Um, that's not true anymore. There's a real blurring. You know, um, kids can watch TV on the Internet. They can watch on a hel handheld device. There's really no hour anymore for children's programming. So there's a real blurring. That's one line. Um, again, at, and the reality and scripted show are also blending. These shows that look like, you know, they're uh, non-actors start out that way, and they're unscripted in the beginning, but, you know, over the course of the series, they become actors with scripts. So there, there's not even a clear line there. I think we'll continue to see these types of changes. But one thing we know is that, you know, Television programming in Hollywood it is broadcast all over the world. Um, I, was, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East over the last 12 months. Everywhere I went, I, I was working with young people with the YPeer Network, the Youth Peer Education Network um, that was started by UNFPA. These kids watch more American television than I do. 
They watch all of the reruns. And I would ask them, why do you watch the medical shows and why do you watch the crime shows? And they said, because this is the only way we can see how justice is delivered and how medicine or health care is delivered. We don't have access to that in our own countries through our own programs right now. Anyone else? I think the one area... I think the one area where television will remain closest to – now, if I, if I really knew the answers to this, I probably – I'd be a very wealthy man. But um, the one area where television will probably remain much more consistent with what it's been in the past than anywhere else is preschool, that it is – there's no better medium for conveying information to very young children than story-based broadcast television, uh, whether, it, whether it's in a magazine format, a fiction format – but conveying stories to, to young people. And, and I strongly believe that we need to in, let even very young children see other real children, see a diversity of real children, that we can't always rely on animation, that we can't uh, – that we really – you have to start peace building at the very youngest of ages, as someone was, was talking about today. And I've seen some just stellar examples just in the last few months – a uh, program from the Netherlands, a series about a little girl who lives in a very diverse apartment block, and every day she gets into some adventure with someone who, who comes from a very different background from her. Sometimes that background is, is national, sometimes it's ethnic, sometimes it's religious. One time she even uh, visits a friend who's lost a leg, and she, so she learns about uh, disability. Uh, an example from Colombia, where they're introducing kids to all the different uh, parts of the country and to how people grow up in very different ways in in what's been a very fractured country through an exchange program. A kid goes to visit someone who lives under very different circumstances, and then the kid who he's visited goes on and visits someone else, and, and sort of a, a domino effect throughout. So I think preschool is probably the area where we'll see it stay the most the same. Jamil? Um, I was going to take the question and turn it for my own purposes. <laughs> Just to be completely transparent. Why I mean, should you I, be I'm different not, from anybody else? Oh, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not good at the predictive stuff at all, and um, um, particularly in this space, because I've talked to a lot of people who've been in, in these industries longer than I have, and they don't seem to know, and so I, don't, I have no clue. But one thing that, um, that you pick up on in doing this work is trends or where things seem to be going, you know, and, and we're engaged more right now in the news media realm than in the dramatic form realm. And one of the things that we've... But by way of just a very brief discussion, one of the things that we do uh, through 80 universities in 25 countries is facilitate a, a, a process by which through a you know, web-based video conferencing technology, students from multiple different countries are having facilitated di dialogue for two hours a week. But a, a highlight for the students every, every semester is, uh, whether they're from Indonesia or Egypt or Kansas or the UK, Netherlands, whatever, is the media production module. And they love this. And we, we basically provide, we get raw footage from Al Jazeera and the Associated Press. And we provide them with basic training in how you cut up a short news clip. And then they all go off on their own and they produce their own unbiased, objective report on what's happening in Gaza or whatever it is that Al Jazeera and Associated Press have provided you know, for that semester. Um, and then they exchange those pieces with one another. And that starts a very profound conversation about why did you introduce it with this music and not that music? How come you focused on the suicide bombing and not the grieving widow? How come you did, you know? And that led to a relationship now with some of these outlets. We just uh, formed a, a partnership with Al Jazeera where they're going to be providing digital media uh, training for some of these young adults. Um, and what they're interested in is what is the content that would filter to the top of a particularly diverse community of young adults from around the world, be they Texas evangelicals or secular human rights activists in France or religious political activists in Jordan or whatever it might be, who are within this network of young adults that we've been working with uh, for the last seven years, and if each of those students was equipped uh, with a respect button, you know, on their web browser, and as they're going through and they're seeing the Swiss Minaret vote and how people are talking about it, they think, wow, that news piece or that commentary or that video really reflects something I didn't really understand before. Finally, that perspective in my community is being given voice. It always gets ignored for more extreme voices. They can click respect. And the stuff Al Jazeera is interested in, we're starting to have this conversation with BBC and others, is... Uh, the stuff that filters to the top, almost like that's a virtual editorial board of young adults. Again, we're experiments. One of many tools that we're experimenting with in how you use The reason I'm getting into all of that, the shift in the news media that we're seeing, not so much in Hollywood, but in the news media, is this shift from just providing information and the importance of giving facts and even the importance of giving a diversity of perspectives to 
sitting in the middle and helping to facilitate a conversation. This is why the Al Jazeera folks were really interested by, by uh, they were as excited as we were about this partnership. And we're hearing this from other news outlets as well, that they're increasingly interested, not so much whether the medium is going to go away, but it's going to become much it's less, becoming much less of a medium that, that again, is, is about getting something out and is about facilitating a conversation, hopefully an informed conversation, and hopefully one that's facilitated in such a way that you don't have people leaving more polarized than they were when they came in. Great. Let me, let me share some experience Please. here. Um, we've done the, the, sh the, 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 the show that you just, show, you just showed up here, the team. We put it on TV. We have a radio adaptation of the same. And then we take the programs out to the villages and screen them. And we then have people engage in facilitated dialogue thereafter. We did ask our researchers, we have a team of researchers from the University of Peace, um, to find out between the three of them, between uh, TV, radio, and the mobile screenings and the dialogue that follows, what is it that gets people to respond more to the content that we are putting across? And the results were, were interesting for us. We, ha we are now convinced that it, it, it is the combination of the three of them that is actually the reason for the success of the series. And if we removed one of them, it, is, it will not be the same anymore. Um, so much so that you know, we've, we are unable to tell whether people acted on the basis of what they saw on TV or what they heard on radio, or whether it was on the basis of the facilitated dialogue that followed. What we are convinced, however, is that when people see it in their living rooms as audience members, they're very passive. They will not act on that information. But when they watch it in a group and they then have some discussion or dialogue that follows thereafter, there is some element of, um, you know, urging one another. There is some encouragement for one another to take some, some, some action after that. And what we've seen is that when we did the first, when they, they saw it the first time, then, we, then they, they watched the, the screenings in the villages during the, the, you know, during the when, we did, when we went out for the mobile screenings, the first time, the second time, third time, the fourth time, they started saying, okay, now we've seen it, so what do we do after this? And it was after that that we started seeing groups starting to emerge and actions start happening. And those people that uh, initially were looking at individuals as, you know, as the other, and I've heard a lot about the other this morning, and, you know, today. You know, people started looking at members of the other ethnic groups as sometimes even as non-humans. Now they started engaging and starting to want to talk again. And it's only then that we started realizing that perhaps it is the fact that they saw it on TV, the TV therefore validated what they then got to see on the ground. And when they had it on radio, it confirmed what they had watched on TV because it was all happening just about the same time. And therefore, it's, I'm not sure that, you know, you can, for, for us, in what we are doing, we think it has to be a combination of the three, probably even more, because even we take it out to schools and we get kids um, or you know, students in high schools to watch the drama and again have teacher-moderated uh, dialogue thereafter. To and they they localize the issues that they see on screen. They then bring them to their school context, where it is about an example. Say, for instance, something to do with corruption. They bring it to the level as to what it is that they can relate to. And it's 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 the fact that they are able to see all these things that I think plays you know works out best for them. Okay, I have one more question, then I'd like to open it up to the floor. Um, Jared, this is a room, pretend, this is a room full of college students. And uh, <clears throat> you've been invited to give career advice to people who want to uh, build peace. And um, what are you going to tell them? That's actually an easy question, surprisingly, because I, I, I do speak a lot at universities and, and, and so forth, and one of the points that I often make, and I think it actually is the most important, is anybody who's interested in building peace presumably is paying attention to something around the world. But I think a lot of students are kind of grappling with the question of, you know, how do I find my niche? You know, how do I, you know, build an area of expertise? You know, am I going to do it on the Arab-Israeli conflict? There's people that are decades older than me that have been doing this for so much longer than me. What can I really do that's different, which is the question that they often ask. And the point that I make is, you know, as somebody who works in the government, I know how little expertise exists on, you know, technology and on tools of the 21st century. Not because, you know, people can't figure it out, but because, you know, the largest demographic that populates U.S. government offices are individuals that were born into a society that didn't have high prevalence of these technologies. And so the advice that I would give is that every single person 
under the age of 30. Every single person at a university or a high school or wherever else has an innate expertise that they probably don't even realize, which is the benefit of being the first generation socialized with high prevalence of uh, satellite TV, mobile phones, Internet. And so, you know, I think that comes with two things. One, it should help kind of shape how they think about things because these technologies are relevant to every issue in every country and um, every discipline. But more importantly, they have a responsibility. You know, there's a huge gap that exists between those that understand the issues and challenges that we face, both new and old, and those that understand and have an innate expert expertise on the tools that need to be leveraged to address those challenges. And so we actually need young people to be, uh, one, proactive in terms of applying their expertise on those tools to those challenges, and then two, uh, you know, advice to people over the age of 30 is look for opportunities to engage and empower you know, young people to do what they're very good at, which is the stuff that they probably don't even realize is significant and prescript, uh, prescriptive to the major challenges that we face. Shamil, how would you uh, I, I think I think Jared's very right about where young people have a comparative advantage over everyone older than them, which is the, the means of the, almost by second nature, as you were saying, these are appliances. I think one thing people, young people don't really have, uh, because none of our cultures really uh, support this in them, is uh, an understanding of how you make sustainable social change. And the way you make sustainable social change, in my view, is not about sort of immediately going outward to the change you want to see in the world, but first grounding in yourself what you stand for, what you're willing to do and not do, uh, and to take an approach to social change that shifts you from, this is an issue I care about, I'm going to find out everyone who agrees with me on that issue, and then I'm going to go to war, literally or figuratively, with the other side, whether it's conservative Republicans or it's Israelis or Palestinians, whatever, to shift from that to, I'm going to take an issue I really care about, and I'm going to engage everyone else who really cares about that issue. I'm going to find a way, and then I'm going to try, try to find a creative way to get a sustainable solution together. That is not inherent in any of our cultures that, that we engage with. It's certainly not inherent here. And I think when I talk to young people about social change, I talk oftentimes about getting grounded in that way first, not least of which because oftentimes you will lose friends, you will make enemies in this space. If People will remember the autobiography of Malcolm X, whether you read the book or saw the movie. If you saw the film, when he's going into this Ivy League campus to, uh, uh, hall to give a talk and this young white co-ed says, I love, you know, what you're doing. Can I help you? And he says no, and he walks right past her, and she breaks down crying on the steps. Well, in the book, you know, later in life, he reflects on that interaction, and, and he says, I wish I had told her to go into her own community because I don't have access there. I'm not going to have the same kind of immediate passport that she will. But that's also the toughest kind of action to take because that's where people will call her a traitor. That's where the tribes that you're dealing with in Kenya will wonder, well, why are you meeting with those people, or what are you doing here? And to prepare and equip young people to deal with that kind of world, whatever the tools they are, they could, they're going to use to affect it is, I think, the primary and most important thing. Great. Barugo, what would you tell college students in Nairobi? I think the, the, the best thing is that which is locally owned, that people believe in. Um, I think we can, one could sit and prescribe um, some formula, but ultimately, if the people don't believe in it again, as I said before, they will, not, they will not even pay attention to it. I think the point is um, the best thing to do is um, develop content or media or format or platforms that create the space for people to develop their own and for people to be able to engage with the issues that uh, they consider most dear to them and that they are able then to generate or come up with solutions that they themselves feel are the best in their context. Um, I think it's, it's very easy to sit down and you know, have some very lofty thoughts on what works and doesn't work and have some great theories about what it is that you know, we, need, you know, we need people to do um, and how they, they should uh, apply the new technology or apply use, make use of media and whatever else you want, to, you want them to do. But if ultimately they do not believe in it, if they don't think it serves their interests, it's a wasted opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think the thing to do really is to get out and seek what it is that people want, first of all, to do with themselves and, encourage and provide the spaces and, the, um, and encourage them to really come up with the solutions that you know, come, you know, respond to their, to their needs. Right. David, I know you want to produce more preschool television to drive Sesame Street out of business, but <laughs> other, other than that, wh what would you tell college students who really want to build peace? I'm actually going to assume for the moment that I'm speaking to an engineering uh, <laughs> class.
class, and I'm, I, because I want to take on a different part of this, and that is to say build out sustainable and connected platforms so that the entire world is able to communicate, not just certain parts of it. We've reached a point with media right now where if you do not appear, you become invisible, you cease to exist. <laughs> So we really need to ensure that all parts of the world are able to communicate with all other parts so that we can have this conversation, not, not just among a privileged few. Sandra, what do you tell the kids at USC? <laughs> I would ask the kids, where is your heartbreak? That's where to focus. It's an inner and an outer process. Uh, because, you know, for a human being to sustain that passion and commitment over time, it has to be very meaningful for them. It may not be something in their local community. It may be something they've been exposed to, you know, uh, overseas, elsewhere. I don't think we can prescribe that, but uh, the key is to go deep inside and find that, that depth of feeling and go with it. The other thing, when I work with the white peers, I always tell them, don't get hung up on tactic tactics. You know, stay with your vision. Believe in yourself. If you stay with that vision and connect to your heart, you'll start drawing all the information and strategies and tactics and technologies and things you need to reach that. And it's true. It may, ta it may not happen in the way you think it will, but if you stay with it over time, believe in your vision. Stay with your vision. Don't let anything get in the way you can succeed. I think that's the main thing. Kids are going to be informing us. Very soon, they're going to be telling us how to get, how to reach our goals. So in terms of strategies and tactics and technology, you know, we know what we know now. It's all changing so fast. It'll be very different in 10 years. So I don't think we need to tell them about that. Storytelling engineers with a heavy heart. That's kind <laughs> of what we need. With a deep heart. With a deep heart, sorry. It could be a light, but deep okay. heart. Um, questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Visitors from all over the world, and many of them are in t new technologies, some are in media. Um, one of the concerns I have about the whole day, but particularly about this afternoon's panel, is the issue of uh, clutter, like you were just saying, that there's, there's so much out there. I mean, terrorists are using the Internet rapidly, and they're really doing all the recruiting that way, effectively, um, through whatever programming they use. Um, as you know, in you know, in Tehran, they use the cell phone to the detriment of the people now. Lately, in in China, as well. Um, but how? Do, I mean, all these wonderful programs do exist. But how do you compete in this collateral market? And how do you make sure that some of these things from the heart and you know that that really promote peace? are actually uh, visible to the millions of kids in villages or wherever that are bombarded with uh, a lot, you know. And Jared, you want to talk a little bit about Iran because mm -hmm. you had such a deep experience there and what's happening in mm -hmm. response. Absolutely. And let me address the first part of your question. It's more than terrorists. I mean, the drug cartels in Mexico use it. You know, gangs use it. I mean, it's very, very pervasive among violent groups, be they terrorists or, or other types of groups. But... You know, again, beyond the pragmatic explanation that I gave earlier about how, you know, this stuff is inevitable, right? So it's getting out there. And so all you don't want to give extra space or more space for hostile actors to use it for hostile purposes. But there's also a historical analogy here. We said the very same comments that you're making are the same comments that we made about the cassette tape in the 1970s. We didn't want to support the cassette tape because we feared that in the midst of the Cold War, it could be used by the Soviets to propagate a communist ideology. And so we decided, you know what? We're not even touching this space, neglecting the fact that this wasn't DARPA creating the Internet. This was a private sector company and a collection of private sector companies putting a new technology out on the public domain. Well, we didn't influence the space until it was you know, far too late. And not only did the Soviets use it, much less interrupted, to push ideology throughout Central Asia and elsewhere, but had it not been for the cassette tape, um, it's very unlikely that Ayatollah Khomeini from his villa in France would have been able to achieve the kind of notoriety that allowed him to come back to such fanfare in November of, of sorry, in February of 1979. Um, and so, you know, the historical analogy there is we have certain lessons learned. Now, the prescription, you know, let's take a place like Iran. You know, in the midst of the, the uh, demonstrations in June, and then since then we're almost coming up on the year anniversary, you know, you know, anybody's fooling themselves if they think we in the State Department don't understand the, the, the grave risks that, that 
come with technology. You know, we talk openly about the opportunities. The press loves sort of talking about you know the way Twitter and Facebook and all these things are being used. But we're well aware of you know the darker side of all of this. You know, that being said, it's out there. People are using it. People are going to continue to use it for good and for bad. So how do we think about this? Well. You know, there's you know, a couple ways that, that, that we're thinking about it. One is, you know, recognizing that it's not about the tools, it's about the people behind the tools. And so after the demonstrations in June of 2009, everybody talked about Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all these things, but nobody talked about who the people were behind these different platforms. And go back to what I said before, we're, we're sort of ushering technologies, you know, breaking down these traditional barriers of age, gender, socioeconomic status, and circumstance that previously prevented you know, any individual that comprised civil society from having a voice and making an impact. You know, now anybody with a cell phone can be a visible member of civil society. I don't think there's any better place to kind of zero in to illustrate this example than the NATO video. You know, the most popular name to come out of the demonstrations in June of 09, it wasn't, you know, the former prime minister and opposition leader, Mousavi. It wasn't any of the sort of more well-known activists. It was a ordinary uh, female individual walking the streets who was murdered um, and had it captured on uh, a video camera and then posted on the web. Now, let me say just a few things about this because it's very important. You know, because of video-capable cell phones, some ordinary individual who was five steps away from Nada Sultan, I don't know if they were male, female, old, young, rich, poor, politically motivated, or just there at the right, at, at the right moment, captured it on their cell phone, and within several hours was able to get it out of Iran on the web. It had been sort of reposted on YouTube under a variety of different names. And uh, that video found its way on the desks and computers of some of the world's most powerful and least accessible people on the planet, presidents, prime ministers, heads of state. Um, now, take cell phones out of the equation and imagine Nada Sultan gets murdered, the same exact events unfold. What do you think happens? A whole bunch of traditional NGOs you know, try to sort of rally behind her case and try to – do you think within a couple hours that story is making it, you know, onto the desks of presidents and prime ministers around the world? I, I doubt it. And so, again, it's not about the technology, but technology, you know, allows things to happen differently or, you know, really sort of changes dynamics. Now, so as – going back to Iran, what we're looking about looking at is finding ways to, you know, give – you know, to put tools in the hands of people and give them the ability to actually utilize those tools. Based on the anecdote I told earlier, it's not our place to tell Iranians or even try to figure out for Iranians how to use these tools to hold their government to account. Um, but it is, you know, U.S. foreign policy now to, you know, wherever people are faced with politically motivated censorship to engage and empower those stakeholders that are allowing them to circumvent it. Um, and so that's one thing that we're trying to do. Um, but the other thing that we're trying to do is – you know, people in places like Iran and elsewhere, even if they're not successful in achieving their objectives, are putting new innovations about civil society out on the public domain. And so whether it's Iran or Colombia or Moldova or anywhere else, you know, there's a, it's a global theater. The world is comprised of one Internet. And, you know, even where people fail, innovations succeed. And what failed in one country might succeed in another country. Great. There was another question back here. Um, it, all the way in the back, sir. Hi, my name is Leonard Doyle. I run an, in, <coughs> an organization for censored journalists called In Free Media. Isn't the point that around the world there's intense repression of, in places where we give a lot of multilateral aid, whether it comes from the World Bank or from other organizations or bilateral aid? And isn't it time that we use some of the leverage, the enormous leverage we have as governments when we're spending public money in these countries to create a space for independent media, not state media, not commercial media? I mean, it's one thing to mention how... Nita appeared on the desks of prime ministers, but the prime ministers probably knew about that from their spy agencies, just like they knew about the death camps in Bosnia. We surely need to empower media that's totally independent of government. And you can do that through a variety of methods, perhaps through trade, isn't censorship and uh, infling, infringing free trade, perhaps through human rights legislation. Who wants to take that one? Shem Shemil? Oh. Look, I, I don't know anybody who would argue against, and, you, and Jared could speak better to the policy element of it, but I don't know anyone who would argue against wanting more independent sources of information. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think, of, look, we're talking a lot now, and we're using the example of, of Iran, and, uh, and also because of what my organization is primarily dealing with right now is, is, is relations between American, European, and predominantly Muslim societies. A, a lot, as soon as you embrace a technology that allows you to give voice to diversity as perspectives. And as soon as you say that that's a good thing, which 
I, I think it is. Uh, you have to be ready to hear things that are going to be really hard for you to hear. Uh, and um, different governments, different American administrations, governments around the world have had different attitudes towards th that kind of thing. But I think as a nonprofit, non governmental sector, to me, uh, it's critically <coughs> important that we allow space for those narratives to come out. If we're hearing from a lot of the young adults who we engage that what's going on in Gaza, or the increase in drone attacks from the U.S. administration are some of the primary lenses through which they're seeing the U.S. engagement, separate from the real inspiration and motivation and hope that they got from both President Obama's election and then his speech in Cairo and more recently the uh, action on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're hearing that. You, know, you can try and squash that opinion. You can try and ignore it. Neither of those, both of those not only don't work, but they're counterproductive. Or you can engage with it and also realize that in this country, as has been already said, you know, a lot of the work that we have to do is also here in terms of understanding the diversity of those perspectives and how differently people view things than we might think or how differently they may view us than we kind of hope or thought that they did. So I, I don't think there's any – you know, independent sources of media is fine. I think if you're talking about governments for me – and I know I'm sitting next to Jared, so you might have a different view – but I think governments for me, that the critical place in this area of – embracing these technologies is, to me, a lot of the power of those technologies is they are giving voice to, to a lot of perspectives. And those perspectives that represent a significant constituency or a huge frustration that's out there, that has to be given voice and then engaged with constructively. At the people-to-people -people level, the policy level, it's a different world. Uh, but I don't think you can escape that. I don't think we can embrace these technologies and then be upset by the fact that some people are voicing their, their anger through them. And, 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 and it, it's unfortunate, but others will be using them through purely destructive means. But I, I separate out the voicing of frustration and the voicing of what is a large-scale pers shared perspective, not just among extremists, but among many people, um, as part of the problem. I think it's part of the solution, especially if we can find a way to actually listen and engage with it constructively. I'd like to close with uh, a question on media literacy. Um, I think it came up today, and Marvin Kalb, I think, was talking about the need to educate, or maybe it was Frank Cessna this morning, educating uh, kids and, and adults, frankly, where the content comes from. So whether something is actually based on fact-checking like a Nightline <coughs> setup piece or whether it's one person's view made in a closet somewhere. Um, what is the role uh, of uh, media literacy, and uh, which has been – talked about endlessly in Washington and Hollywood and New York and all kinds of other places. No one's really getting it done, in my opinion. Um, is, this a, is this a dog chasing its tail, or is this, uh, are there actual ways of uh, making this happen? I think we're seeing great examples of how it <coughs> actually can be made to happen in Canada and the UK, where it's become an integral part of the, the school curriculum. I think the problem that we faced here in the U.S. is that we've treated media literacy as a protectionist uh, part of the curriculum, teach you how not to get screwed over by the corporations or, or you know, that kind of approach, as opposed to accepting that you – know, look at the statistics we saw this morning about the amount of time young people are spending with screens. We teach young people to read critically in print. Why are we not teaching them to view critically no matter what the screen is that they're looking at? And, and to think critically about everything they're, that they're seeing. I'll throw in a couple of data points. 52% um, of regular viewers of television um, report that they believe the health content on television on scripted shows is accurate. 26% of regular viewers of TV report, t uh, uh, report scripted television shows among their top three sources of health information. So it's also, also uh, on these data points, um, nearly half, now it's just over half of regular viewers of television report learning something new about a disease or how to prevent it from scripted television shows, and one-third of those viewers take action on what they learn. That means if the content is inaccurate, they're taking action. If it's accurate, we're doing them a service. So just in the way of a model, um, when there is a significant TV health storyline that we've worked on, we post web links to the show's website. So if you go to the House website, you will see links to CDC or other credible sources of information so that viewers can find 
credible information and not just rely on the TV shows. Well, first, I would like you all to stay up here. And secondly, I just would like us all to thank this incredibly talented group of professionals who are building peace every day. Thank you for being here.